Hello, I'm Dr. Julia Lehman from Mayo Clinic Dermatology, and the purpose of this video today is to talk about Epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, or EBA. If you'd like more information, I would refer you to the March 2009 edition of the International Journal of Dermatology, which has more information on this topic. First, I'd like to talk about the clinical features of this condition, and then move on to talk about how to diagnose it, and finally, some treatment considerations. Clinically, EBA tends to affect middle-aged adults and can present anywhere on the skin surface, but usually localizes towards trauma-prone areas. The, it presents with tense blisters, which tends to not have much associated inflammation clinically, and these blisters can heal with milia and scarring. Now, while these findings may be characteristic for EBA, they certainly aren't specific, so laboratory testing is required to establish the diagnosis. The first test to perform would be a skin biopsy, and a portion of the sample should be sent for standard histopathology. Now, under the microscope, we would see a subepidermal blister, usually with minimal associated inflammation. Now, there is an inflammatory rich, or excuse me, an inflammation rich form of EBA, and uh, this is usually associated with abundant neutrophils, and sometimes some eosinophils as well. Now, a posti inflammatory subepidermal blister is not a particularly specific histo histopathologic finding either, so additional testing is required. The next best test to perform would be direct immunofluorescence. Ideally, a portion of the specimen that was obtained with the original skin biopsy or a different skin biopsy specimen should be sent for this procedure. Now, this involves labeling, uh, immunofluorescence labeling uh, of antibodies, and now would probably be a good time to talk about the pathogenesis of EBA. In short, it's thought to be caused by IgG autoantibodies directed against collagen 7. And when you consider the anatomy of the basement membrane, collagen 7 is located at the bottom of that as part of the anchoring fibrils. So, on direct immunofluorescence, uh, basically we tag the patient's autoantibodies on the tissue, and this would show linear deposition of IgG along the basement membrane zone. And often C3 will also show linear deposition. This also is a nonspecific finding, and as it can be seen in pemphigoid, as well as a number of other uh, subepidermal autoimmune blistering disorders. So, the next best test to perform would be indirect immunofluorescence. For this test, the patient's serum is tagged and uh, basically control human skin is then incubated with one mole of sodium chloride, which induces an artificial split at the lam le level of the lamina lucida. The lamina lucida is a particularly vulnerable area of the basement membrane, and so it is it's located above the lamina densa, which we'll talk about shortly, but also above the anchoring fibrils. And so we would expect that the target of the autoantibodies involved in EBA would be below the lamina lucida, which is identified by the split created with the mon one molar sodium chloride. So the patient's serum is then put together with the um, artificially split human skin, and what we should see in EBA is we should see linear deposition of IgG and potentially C3 at the base of the artificially induced split. Um, this can also be seen in some forms of mucous membrane pemphigoid, as well as bullous systemic lupus erythematosus, but does help us narrow down the diagnosis. At this point, clinical pathologic correlation is required to uh, diagnose epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. On a research basis, additional testing is available that would help to further uh, confirm the anatomic location of the pathology in this condition. And other tests could include collagen-4 immunoperoxidase stain. And basically, the major component of lamina densa, which is again located above the anchoring fibrils containing collagen-7, the target for the autoantibodies in EBA. Um, collagen-4 marks the lamina densa. So basically, when collagen-4 immunoperoxidase stain is used to mark the tissue, we'd expect that the patient's blister would be located below this. Other uh, studies that can be performed would include fluorescence overlay mapping, electron microscopy, laser scanning confocal microscopy, and recently a test for ELISA, uh, which is a serum study, um, was 
was uh, developed, and it looks for collagen 7 autoantibodies specifically. So that can be a helpful diagnostic adjunct as well. It should be noted that bullous systemic lupus erythematosus also is associated with autoantibodies directed against collagen 7, but often this has different clinical findings. So once epidemolysis bullosa acquisita has been diagnosed in a patient, the next consideration is how to treat them. The first line treatment is usually systemic corticosteroids such as prednisone. Then other steroid sparing immunosuppressive agents may be introduced and because EBA is a very rare condition, there have not been well designed or large studies such as uh, randomized controlled trials looking at medications in EBA, so we're left with a handful of case reports to help guide treatment decisions. Often empiric treatment is tried with patients and um, different medications are introduced in a stepwise approach depending on the patient's response. Unfortunately, EBA tends to be fairly refractory to treatment, but the inflammatory forms do tend to do a little bit better. Um, Epidermolysis bullosa acquisita itself can cause considerable morbidity and also can be associated with some other conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, so it's important to have a high level of suspicion if patients have a positive review of systems besides the skin. So this has been a brief review of the clinical, histopathologic, and treatment considerations with EBA. I hope it's been helpful, and I really appreciate your attention. Thank you very much.